Good morning. Great place to be on a Wednesday morning. A lot worse places to be than, than being here, I'll tell you that. It's better than being in jail, isn't it? <laughs> My job, I usually go to prison a couple of times a week. So, ain't nothing better than, than being in here, than being someplace locked up in prison. I go into them places, and uh, it's, it's a bad situation. Turn with your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. And Romans chapter 3, verse 24, and we'll get started here this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And Romans chapter 3, verse 24, Romans chapter 3, verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now, my message this morning is uh, a three-part message. It was assigned that way. Freedom from the penalty of sin and freedom from the power of sin and eventually freedom from the presence of sin. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together as a body of Christ, and look into your word and learn to be more thankful for what you accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary. We thank you for that. Thank you for the folks that are here today and, and those on the Internet, that uh, your word would be appreciated and your word would, would, would just go deep down inside of us so that the life of Christ can work through us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, we're going to look at the... the Freedom from the penalty of sin, and that happens in a moment of time. The moment that you trust in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to go to the cross at Calvary and die. He was buried and raised again on the third day. The moment you trust in that, you're, you're free from the penalty of sin. And then that freedom from the power of sin, it, it happens uh, from the time that you get saved until the rapture, until the catching of the way. We're free from the power of sin. Rodney had a good, good, good uh, teaching on that last night, and I appreciate that, Rodney. I don't know if he's here or not, but that was really good. And then eventually, at the catching up, we're going to be free from the presence of sin. Okay? But that freedom from the penalty of sin, man, I remember well the night that I got saved. And I was freed from that... Uh, penalty of sin. I was religious. I went to church. I'd done everything they told me to do. I'd uh, said the sinner's prayer, asked Jesus to come into my heart, done everything that, that you're supposed to do. But then one night I went to a, a meeting like this at Cedar Lake, Indiana, and, and a gentleman preached on the gospel, the gospel message, the simplicity of of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I had never trusted in that and that alone. And up until that time, someone talked about the lake of fire. I got scared, man. Although I had done everything, I was teaching Sunday school, driving the school bus on Sundays, but the problem is I wasn't saved. I thought that's all there was. That was it. I did what they told me to do. But the night that I got saved, and I trusted in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on my behalf. <laughs> Lake of Fire don't mean nothing no more to me, to me personally. It has no threat upon me because my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he freed me from that penalty, and, that, and I'm free from that. That that that's, has no hold on me. So that's what we're going to look, look at tonight. Now let me ask you a question. What is the penalty of sin? That's what we're free from. At the moment, they got away. We're, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Well, what does Romans chapter uh, 6, verse 23 say? Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. That's our paycheck. That's what you earned 
That's what I am with my sin is death, okay? That's what we're freed from at the moment that we're saved. Uh, recently, I probably shouldn't tell this, I got a speeding ticket <laughs> back in February. Can you believe that? <laughs> I got a speeding ticket. Well, I paid the fine. You know, I sent the money in. But you know what? It's still on my record. You can look at my record and say, Carl, he's speeding. <laughs> you know what? When Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, mm -hmm. he paid my sin debt, and there's no record of my sin. Amen. Isn't that great? I think that's tremendous. I love that. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. From Adam to Moses, everybody's going to die. If you live long enough before the rapture, before the catching of the way, away of the church, the body of Christ, we're all going to die. That's that degenerative nature of sin at work. And the eventual end of that is death. You know, I get up this morning and I took a couple pills, put some drops in my eyes, found my glasses. You know, I look around and talk to people, and you see how sin works. And it eventually, we die. That, that's the penalty. That's, from, that's the effect of living in a sin-cursed world. Sin, folks, is your enemy. You know, a lot of people look at sin and see that as a, a fun thing, a playful thing. Sin is your enemy. It will destroy your soul. It will destroy your health. And in it, and it, it's actually going to kill you. That's the effects of living in the sin cursed world that we live in. That's the first death that Christ freed us from, is, is that death. But there's a second death, which that's the one that I was always afraid of. That's the one that, even before, man, I knew that there was a lake of fire. And that death in the lake of fire has always scared me. And I've always been concerned about that. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. So there's two deaths that we're freed from. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says this. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars which have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. That's the bad one. That second death, you know how long that lasts? That's eternal, the Bible says. That's eternal. And if that's not enough to scare you, when I got saved that night, man, I was so happy. That had no effect upon me. Had no effect upon me. Because my Savior paid that penalty of my sin in that lake of fire. And that was a great thing. Romans chapter 6, or 3, verse 23 says what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, as good as you can be, I let, you know, we read those things there in Revelation chapter 1, and it says, people will say, well, I ain't none of that stuff. <laughs> I said, well, are you a liar? <laughs> well, I told a little white lie. All liars. <laughs> Colors don't matter. All liars in a lake of fire. And that one is going to get all the goody two shoes. <laughs> that gets everybody. Everybody, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means all, doesn't it? But Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, But the wages of sin is death. That's what we earned. But, what does it say? But, there's a contrast. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, what he, what he accomplished for us. Romans 4, 4 and 5 says, But to him that worketh not, you can't work to 
to earn your salvation. I don't care how good you are, how many times you go to church, how much you tithe, how many tracks, none of that. See? Because there's only one work that God accepts. What is that? That's the work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross at Calvary. The apple of his eye. We're, can you imagine? You having that little, that, that son. And it grows up to be an adult son. And you give that, your very own son, your only son, to die on a cross at Calvary. And somebody says, that's not enough. You know, I can't imagine your very own son. But that, that's, what, that, that's what happens. When Christ died on the cross at Calvary, he died and paid for both our physical and our spiritual death, that death in the lake of fire. He paid them both. He paid them both. They're both, they're both taken care of. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Well, let me ask you, what happens when you're cut off out of the land of the living? You're dead. <laughs> you're dead. You're cut off out of the land of the living. Then you're in the land of the dead. Okay? You keep reading. Get down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Now we're getting into the second death of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When his soul an offering for sin. So he, for he shall see his seed and he shall protect his days and the pleasures of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see, when Christ died, it wasn't just a physical death that he died. Your sin and mine was laid upon Christ, and he suffered in his very soul of who he was. Your soul is who you really are. See? That, that, that's your personality. The person that makes all the decisions in your life and who you are, that's your soul. And your soul lives forever somewhere. It's eternal. And it's going to either live in hell or in heaven somewhere throughout all of eternity. And it has memory recall. And it, and it remembers things and knows and feels just like you do today. And it's that second death that Christ paid for here on the cross at Calvary as well as that first death. That second death being what? Death in the lake of fire where the worm never dies where your soul ne never dies. Verse uh, 12. Therefore, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Christ paid that second death and paid for your soul, not being in that lake of fire. But I look at that, and I, that, that's tremendous. Psalms chapter 22, verse 1 says, Psalms chapter 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You, you do know why, don't you? When, when Christ was hanging on that cross at Calvary, and he uttered those words, your sin was laid upon your Savior. Can God look upon sin? See, he had to forsake his son there because your dirty, rotten sins and mine were laid upon our Savior hanging on that cross. And that's how he paid for them. He paid for them that way. Psalms chapter 22, verse 6 says, I am a worm and not a, not a man. That, that soul Another word for that that God uses is, is that worm, that worm that never dies. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24 says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. 
for their worm shall not die. What is it that don't die about you? It's your soul. It's your soul that's going to live somewhere either in heaven or in a lake of fire throughout all of eternity. See, when we talk about being freedom, free from the penalty of sin, it's much, much more than that physical death. It's your eternal death. It's your spiritual death in that lake of fire. That, that's, that's important. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, we read that earlier, where the worm never dies, where the worm ne never dies. You see, to lose your soul is, to, is to, for your soul to spend eternity in the lake of fire. And that's what we're afraid of. There's no hope. There's no hope at that point. First Thessalonians says, verse 4, verse, verse 13, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, says that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. You know, well, well, who is the others that have no hope? That's those folks that haven't trusted in what Christ did on the cross at Calvary. The, and, and trusted in that and that alone. There's people that have no hope. And those are the ones that have no hope, those that haven't trusted in and believed in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to go to that cross at Calvary and die. They have no hope. They have no hope. Uh, when Christ died on the cross at Calvary, he died your physical death and your physical and your spiritual death. Both were taken care of there when he went on the cross at Calvary and did that. But the gift of God, that verse says, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, eternal life, not eternal life in that lake of fire. There are two different things there. So what do we do? We stop working. Get off that treadmill, that performance system. Stop wishing and hoping and just simply trust in what Christ did in your behalf on the cross at Calvary, that Christ paid your sin debt. And there's nothing that you can do in addition to that. That is freedom from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. Christ paid your sin debt when he went to the cross at Calvary and died. He paid both your physical sin debt and your spiritual sin debt so that your soul then goes to, to, to be with the Lord. Okay? Now, we'll shift gears a little bit now. And that's, the, that's freedom from the penalty of sin. There's also freedom from the power of sin. Freedom from the power of sin is the right now time. In a sense, if you've already been saved, that's time past, if you will, the moment that you got saved. But you're also free, free from the penalty of sin. And that's the right now. And that's something that sometimes folks have a hard time understanding. Now, there's a difference between being freed from the power of sin and to say that you've never sinned. That's, that, that, that's two different issues. But you're freed from where sin controls your life. You're freed from that. You're freed from the reign of grace, someone said. Someone said. And you're, 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 you're now reigned by grace. And that's important to get a handle on that and understand what those things are there. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 is a... Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, much more, talking about salvation, much more... There's, I'm sorry, well, there, it's both verses, 9 and 10. <laughs> it's verse 9 and 10, but, okay. But the issue there is much more, we shall be saved by his life, okay? That's, that's freedom from the power of sin and sin ruling your life and your, sin having dominion over your life. But you're right, the much more is verse 9, and there's much more in verse 10. It's in both verses. And that one is, is something that you need to have a handle on that. The, the Christian life, 
Is it hard to live? It's impossible to live. The Christian life is impossible to live. You can't live it in your flesh. The only way the Christian life can be lived is by Jesus Christ himself. And that's Jesus Christ in you coming out of you. And that, that's important to have a handle on that and to be able to understand how that works. How in the world does Jesus Christ get in you in order to live out of you? Where is Jesus Christ today? He's in heaven, isn't he? He's at the right hand of God the Father. Well, see, when the Holy Spirit baptized you, he baptized you into Christ and Christ into you. And now that you've got Christ in you, you intake the word of God. And then Christ can come out of you because he's in you and you have the word of God in you. Look at, uh, read, read, read a couple of verses here, and, and we'll look at some, more, some things about what I just said. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Some, some other men are going to read some more details about this. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. When did that happen? I am crucified with Christ. When Christ died on the cross at Calvary, when he was crucified on the cross at Calvary, you were there also, okay? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Right now where you said, if you're saved and you trust that, Christ is living in you. And, it, and it's a spiritual life of Christ living in you. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, the faith of the Son of God. That was God's faithfulness, Christ's faithfulness to go to the cross at Calvary and die and give his life. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, God set up a law in Romans chapter 8, verse 2 through 5. God set up a law that frees us from the power of sin and death. God set that law up. And that's how it is when Christ comes to live within you. Your spirit then can bear spirit with the spirit of God. You can intake the word of God rightly divided. And that word begins to come out of you. You're, that's Christ coming out of you. As you, as you proclaim the, the word of Christ. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says, when Christ, who is our life, that's how Christ is your life. He's in you, and as you intake the word of God, that is Christ coming out of you as you're preaching it and teaching it and telling others. Is that a decision that you make as to whether or not you allow Christ to come out of you? Just the same as, as you made a decision to trust Christ and believe in what he did, and he comes to live within you, you have to make a decision to intake the word of God, to learn it, to read it, and to study it rightly divided in order that Christ can come out of you. What's his name? His name is what? The word of God. You know what Revelation said? His name is the word of God. So if he's going to come out of you and he's going to live his life through you, it's the word of God that's going to come out. You see that? That's his name. That's who he is. <laughs> that's who he is. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 says, says, don't you know you were baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. So you have resurrection life. What do you do? You reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God. 
alive to Christ that's already living in you, and you're intaking the word of God in order that Christ, that's power over sin, see? That's so that sin doesn't dominate your life. Something else is dominating it. You see that? Well, what's dominating your life now that's going to replace the sin issue? It's the word of God. It's Christ living in you and coming out of you. So I ain't telling you nothing about me today. Hopefully, it's Christ coming out. It's his word. His name is the word of God. Why is his name the word of God? That's who he is. He's the living word. Thank you. And, and that's what it means for, for Christ to live in you and come out of you. It's for his word, rightly divided. And understanding that, making that distinction. His resurrection is your resurrection. And you're resurrected to a newness of life. Before, you were bound up with sin. And sin controlled your life. See? You didn't even care before you were saved about sin. Sin wasn't an issue. It didn't, you know, no big deal. But now, you're a new person once you're saved. And you have a new life after you were saved. Because Christ lives in you. You study the word of God. You understand it. You have, you have the ability and the knowledge how to rightly divide it. Time passed, but now in the ages to come, you know what God's doing right now today and you're in a dispensation of grace. And it's different than what he did in time past. And it's different from what he's going to do in the future. And, that's, and you can tell people about that. You can share that information. That's what that's to, that new identity. See? His life now becomes your life. His life is my life. And we share it. And we tell people about it. He, he is the Word of God. If Christ is our life, what is your life? What is it then? It's the Word of God. <laughs> if Christ is my life, and it is, then the Word of God is your life. Proclaiming the word of God, rightly divided. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and he does, the moment that you got saved, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The moment that you got saved, God the Holy Spirit come to live within you and you quicken, made alive, energizes your body in order that Christ can live through you and come out of you. You're a new man. Old things have passed away, right? You're a new man, and you're alive unto God. Before, you were alive unto sin. Now, you're alive unto God. You come out of Adam into Christ, and you're a new creature, and God's got new plans for you and, and new things that we should, we should be doing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, what does that say? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 says that you're a saint of the Most High God. You know who your identity is? Your identity, God says you're a saint. Boy, sometimes you don't feel like a saint, do you? There's a lot of times I don't feel like a saint. You know, you get up and go stumbling around and can't find your shoes and, and you know, all that stuff. And we forget. We get out there in, in, in the busyness of life and somebody cuts in front of you and, and all that kind of business. In all of that, when I got that speeding ticket, I'm still saint. Amen. I'm, but you have, to, you have to understand what your identity is and live in the identity that God made you. Don't, don't try to live in your failures. See, that, don't live in your failures because you've got a lot of them. See? 
But that's not who you are. A lot of people, myself included, you, you, you do that. You see? You have a tendency to live in your, in, in your failures. No, 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 no. See? You live in who God says you are. You live in who God says you are. You're, you're, a, you're a saint of the Most High God, and you have all spiritual blessings. And I like that word all. That's all that God wants you to have. He's already given them to you. Now that, that's, a, that's a different lesson. But you're clear. Yeah. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, He freely gave us, I'm sorry, He freely gave us all things. All things that He wants you to have. You don't have to beg and hope and wish for anything. He's already given them to you. Past tense. I already given them to you. John chapter 6, verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 63 says, These words I speak unto you, they are life and their spirit. These words that I speak unto you. What's his name? The living word. Revelation says his name is the Word of God. When he lives within you, what is it that's living within you? His Word. What I'm trying to get you to understand and, and, and to see is it's his Word rightly divided as he lives his life through you that he wants you to proclaim and tell others about it. Because there's a lost world out there that knows absolutely nothing about rightly dividing the Word of God. They make it a big big old pot of stew and just pick out anything that feels good on any certain day. And that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That's not how God set it up. See, you're no longer under that reign of sin, people. But rather, we're under that reign of grace. I think somebody said that. And I, I like that. Okay? Christ come to live within you the moment you, that you got saved. And his desire... Is for his life to work out of you. You set yourself aside. It's not what you can do in the flesh or anything of that nature, but rather it's what Christ already accomplished for us. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. We've read that verse, I think, here several times this week. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as is it in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That word, it energizes. See, as you take in the word of God, it's designed to energize your inner man. And then Christ works out of you through his written word. That, that, that's living the life of Christ. That's what that is. That's what's to, con to control you is the word of God. It's control your life. It's his life in you, and, and that, that, that being the word of God, and that's to control you. Let me ask you a question. What controls you? Not you particular, but in general. There's people out there you want, well, what control? Is it money? Is it money that a lot of people, boy, it's money, man. I want to be rich. I've been wanting to be rich since I was 10 years. It's money. Well, is it popularity? The popularity contest? Is that what that controls some folks? Is it alcohol, booze? I can't do anything. I have me a big shot of boo, whatever it is. Boo. Is it drugs that control? Sure. Drugs control a lot of people's lives. I deal with them on a daily basis. It's drugs that control them. Is it sex that controls people? Some people. I mean, the list is endless. Is it things that control? Boy, if I can just get this one more new thing. See, all the stuff that controls people's lives. Self-righteousness. Boy, I'm just good. <laughs> I'm just going to grunt real hard and be good. 
for God. Be good for God. Just all that grunting, all that self-righteousness, all those things in the flesh that God don't accept any of that. that someone said, <laughs> so, someone said, there's only one thing that you take to your salvation. I like that. Someone said that this week. You know what it is? It's your sin. <laughs> your sin is the only thing about you that has anything to do with your salvation. God takes care of that. For all have sinned. Yeah, you too. I was there. I sinned, and God took care of all that. But God took care. You know, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 says that Paul was a big shot, wasn't he, in his religion and what he did. Let's, let's look at that for a minute. Romans, or Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. If you want to look at somebody that was a big shot, your apostle Paul, before he was saved, he, he was one of the biggies. He was one of the big, big shots in the Jewish religion. Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. You, you see how he started that out? Do you have confidence in the flesh? If you do, just forget it. Be like Paul. That's something in the past. Fine. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if, if other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Man, he had confidence in what he did and who he was and his heritage. Circumc and then he's going to lay it out here for you. Tell, tell you what a big shot he was. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the rightness which is it is of the law, blameless. But what things were counted to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I am suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So anything that you can do in the flesh and perform and do, and as wonderful as they are, they're equal with those piles out in a pasture. See? Th that's what they are. That's what they're equal to. And you and I, like Paul, count them what he does. They're just dung. They're just dung. <laughs> My grandson last night, we were in the room, and I was going over, and I said, Brother, you know what dung is? He goes, what, Paps? <laughs> oh, that's <was> funny. <laughs> it's worthless. He counted it all as worthless done. Why? That I may know him. That I may know him. How do you know him? Through his word. You know him through his word. His name is the word of God. That's who he is. His name is the word of God. And you know him through his word. See, not having mine own righteousness, rather the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. You know him by knowing his written word rightly divided. And that's Christ living in you. And then when you proclaim it and you're telling others about it, that's Christ coming out of you. That's Christ living his life in you and coming out of you. And you, and to, you have a certain choice to make as to whether or not, to what degree you want his word to live in you and come out of you. Right? Wrong? <laughs> you know, I'm almost an old man. <laughs> Depending on who you talk to. I'm almost an old man. There might be one or two people here older than me. But people, you know, I'm 70 years old. And there's a few things physically that I can't do that I used to. I used to be able to run and jump and all that. I, I don't really care anything that much about I was talking to a guy one time. He says, if you see me run, then you better run too because somebody's chasing me. <laughs> 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 I 
But, you know, I'm 70 years old. Physically, I can't do a whole lot. Mentally, I'm losing that too. You know, I can't talk as fast as I used to. I'm, I'm losing my vocabulary. I'll be saying, starting to say something, a word that part, used to be, I can't bring it up. It's disappeared. <laughs> that's what happens. That, that's that sin nature that we live in, live in today. It gets you physically and you get mentally. And I was thinking about that. Everything gets a little bit slower. You know, I look around. Some of you, the effects of living in that sin-cursed world. It's, it's starting to get some of it. It's starting to get some of you. Your glasses, hearing aids, you know, and, and all that kind of business. But you know what? You know what? My identity in Christ has never changed. I'm just as much a saint right now as I was 30-some years ago, the moment I got saved. No, that's, not, that's, not going, that's going to get better. Amen. See? You need to put your trust and your confidence in something that doesn't change. The Word of God don't change. Amen. See? I'm still a saint of the Most High God. You're a saint. You're a saint of the most. Don't matter how old you are. That doesn't, it makes it even better the older that you get. Because you realize you're going to jerk that thing off the front of your face one day. You're not going to need it. You're going to need that oxygen. You're going to get that new body. You're going to need any of that. See? Comfort them with these words. That's what that's about. Realizing that one day we're going to be in the presence of almighty god and we're not the presence we're going to be free from the presence of sin and sin's effects we're not even going to be around sin at the rapture the catching up of the church of the of of, of, of the body of christ and we're going to be free from the presence of sin and i've lived quite a few years And I've seen sin wax worse and worse and worse and worse. I've lived long enough to see that. You know, somebody 25 years old, they can't really see. It's just how it is. The sinfulness that's going on today, it's just the way it's always been. And they can't really see or have experienced the decline in moral of the, of the people that would. So to be free from that presence of sin, to me, well, that's going to be a great thing. Amen. That's going to be, a th- and I look forward to that. And no matter what happens, no matter what happens, you're free from the penalty of sin, death, and the second death. You're free from the power of sin, Sin no longer has to rule your life. It don't have to dominate your life. It don't have to take over your life. And one day, guess what? We're going to be free from the presence of sin. What a wonderful thing that's going to be. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, this morning for the work that you accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary. Not only freedom from physical death, but freedom from that second death in the lake of fire. And we're, you're freed us from the power of sin so that power don't dominate us and control us. And we can live the life that your life, your life living out of us through your written word of God. And thankful that one day, God, we're going to be free from the presence of sin. And, then, and we're going to be in your presence at the catching up of the church of the body of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.